Um, so I'm basically standing between you and dinner, which is never a really great place to be. Um, so I will try to keep this entertaining despite having no graphics at all and no demos. Um, so this is totally not an old man yells at cloud talk. So um, I, I, marketing said that would not be a good title. So that is not what the session is, right? Um, but instead, I would like to talk about the limits and the constraints of Ceph so we can have a better understanding of where Ceph actually does make sense and how that translates to using it in reality. And also some, some patterns that we have noticed with customers share some war stories where we have seen people slightly deviate from how Ceph should be used. Um, and why I'm talking about this, so my name is Lars Morowski Bre. I'm working at SUSE and I'm kind of the reason SUSE got into the Ceph parts. I mean, the actual reason is obviously Sage, but at SUSE, um, that was probably my fault. Um, and I also represent SUSE on the Ceph Foundation board these days. And ultimately, many of the escalations at customers or many of the high-level questions end up on my desk. So I have basically seen everything in the architecture where people propose, this is what we could do with Ceph. Um, or this is how it went terribly wrong and somebody needed somebody to calm down the customer while an actual engineer went in and fixed the problem. So all of these are might end up on my table eventually. Um, so yeah, so it might seem odd to come to a Cephalocon and say, well, you know, these are where Ceph may not be the best fit or where things went wrong, but Everybody keeps telling you where, where Ceph makes sense, so maybe we should look at the other side as well. Um, so at the end of the day, nothing I'm saying here is going to go into no, that's a no-go area for Ceph, right? That's not what this is. All these issues were overcome eventually, um, and they were solved, but they are simply different use cases where you, know, you have to invest less or more effort to make, you know, get a good return on investment on Ceph. Um, so, and let's start this with this slide, right? When you really need Ceph, nothing else will do, right? There's no other open source project that can handle that hyperscale scenario when you're like, when you're like CERN or anyone else who has like hundreds of petabytes worth of storage, a massively parallel client workload, and all those things that we're going to talk about in a bit, um, then there's just nothing else, right? Ceph is a great solution, the best if that's what you need, right? Um, so I'm not here saying Ceph is a bad idea. That would be self-defeating and I like my bread on my table. And um, so that's, that's, that's definitely not what I want. So Ceph is great, but let's look at why Ceph is great and where it is great. So um, Sage hinted at that in his keynote this morning. Um, so Ceph has been designed with a few things in mind. Um, but before we look at that, look at what what was there before software-defined storage, right? Um, the things that earned my bread on my table before I went to Ceph were literally the first ones, right? The um, HA clusters, two nodes, replicated storage, um, network attached storage, exporting storage to a bunch of other nodes in the cluster, um, you know, or then maybe you had a cluster concurrent file system on top of a storage area network, um, and let's be clear here, a storage area network is nothing else but a very expensive network attached storage device with fiber channel interfaces, right? That's all they, those fancy boxes are. Um, so they're sort of equivalent in a way. Um, and then ultimately true scale out storage, right? And there's like different tiers. And when we talk about true scale out storage, it sometimes feels like we have forgotten that all these other approaches also exist. Um, that, that's a bit weird. Um, so what are the design goals for Ceph? Um, like, it's literally targeting large hyperscale storage systems. It was designed also at a time where hard drives were the most prominent feature of storage devices. Um, and that's fine, right? Um, it also values correctness and a particular interpretation of consistency over performance. Um, correctness is really important. Nobody likes it when their storage layer gets their connect correctness and consistency properties wrong, right? That's, that's just not... The storage losing data is not a good place to be. Um, but there are other consistency models that in some cases can work better. Like when you look at how we replicate object storage, that's eventually consistent, right? So when we replicate S3 with Router's Gateway, 
it's not immediately as tightly consistent as a local Rados cluster, right? Um, and so sometimes people refer to other consistency models as cutting corners, and I don't think that's what it is. It's just different approach. It's different kinds of guarantees your storage layer provides. And Ceph Rados provides some of the highest guarantees that you're used to, right? So they basically provide the same semantics that a local, a correct local file system would provide on a single node, right? And that's, that's great because those are the semantics your application is used to. Um, that's what you expect from CephFS so that you can just take your regular file system workload and put it on top of CephFS. Um, there have been other approaches that allowed it to scale better because honestly, those POSIX file system semantics, memory map coherence, kind of tricky to scale. We'll talk about that in a second as well. So really, so this is basically where we're coming from. We were specifically targeting the use case that very few people of us have at home, right? So, and there's another trade-off here. So centralization versus distribution. Um, centralization is very efficient. It also doesn't scale. Uh, distributed modes of decision making are less efficient, but scale. So which one do you want, right? They, it's kind of tricky. Um, Ceph avoids most coordination for the direct data path. That's what Crush is about, right? Each client node can compute, OK, that OSD has that block. I'm not going to give you the fifth walkthrough of Crush at the end of the day. But that's basically the idea, right? So you can directly connect to the OSD that holds your data. And so there you don't have to go through a single, you know, single gatekeeper or anything. So Ceph is what we would call a client cluster protocol versus what traditional NFS or iSCSI are basically client server protocols, right? With perhaps some, some features there. Parallel NFS, of course, is fully different. Um, already we can see that even in the Ceph architecture, that's not quite true. Right? Not everything is fully scale out. The so MONS, because that's something you really want, very tightly coordinated, and just on queue, Joao walks in. Um, the MONS use pack source because that data needs to be strongly consistent, and it's actually centralized. The maps are centralized. right? And the metadata server for CephFS is also kind of centralized because that's, you, know, the, uh, you get ordering guarantees that you have to satisfy if you want to be a POSIX compliant file system. And so that's not fully distributed either. We, with the multi-MDS, what actually happens is that certain parts are scaled out and delegated, but ultimately there's a single source of truth. Um, RBD mirroring is somewhat familiar when you enable that. Um, supposedly asynchronous replication mechanism. Um, you have to then make sure that the data you replicate is ordered so that you actually end up with a consistent copy at the other side. And that's where that performance hit comes from, right? Um, and then in some other cases, we have chosen to have bitwise identical mappings or copies of data on several nodes, where this logically equivalent. Um, for example, when I, when I have like records, I'm keeping track of customers buying, you know, customer A buys product one and customer B buys product two. Um, those two transactions, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter in which order I save them, right? But if you save them to a file or a Rados object, you have to have that in the same order. If you had a different model like Confluence or so on, you could actually reorder the transactions without having to coordinate the exact bit layout on disk. So again, that's a trade-off that Ceph makes that impacts how fast we can scale. If you had different append, append semantics, you could just keep, OK, there's a new transaction appended to that log. And you wouldn't have to you know, make sure that they're all bitwise identical. Um, and that's why a local system like NFS and NFS server where everything goes through that one gateway can, or a local node mounting a local file system, they have all the state and memory. They don't need to coordinate with anyone else, right? They are perfectly omniscient about what's going on with all other clients because they are all other clients. And NFS gets away with that by not actually being POSIX compliant in full, right? They, they cut corners. They, they claim one thing and then deliver another. That sometimes is a bit tricky. But we have all gotten so used to NFS being broken that it just works in practice. Um, it's true. I can't have it. Um, so, and that's also where it comes from when we look at, you know, customers go, well, my system is freezing when an error happens and recovery is slow. Well, yeah. Um, Ceph, you know, you have by default all copies, even with replicas, erasure coding, doesn't matter, all copies are on other nodes, right? They all go through that slow, relatively slow network interface, right? And Locally, when I pull a hard drive, the controller tells me your hard drive is gone. 
When an OSD goes down, mm, it's not answering. Is it coming back? I don't know. Let's wait another second. So you have in distributed system, Ceph is not alone in this, right? Every distributed system has this. Pacemaker had the same problem. We have to wait until we can declare a node down, and then we have to reach consensus about that node being down, and then we have to do recovery, maybe fence it, depending on what kind of guarantees you're satisfying. So you pull a drive, and this, or a node, and you, you know, your I.O. stops for a second or two, or depending on however long. So distributed systems and real time are not perfectly compatible under all circumstances. Um, so there are different, you know, different use cases. And about that network, network traffic, when you look at erasure coding, we have one model that's called locally redundant codes, local redundant erasure codes, yeah, the LRC plugin, um, where you can keep additional state, say, within a rack to make sure that you don't have to cross traffic across your top of rack infrastructure to minimize the network impact of recovery when you scale, right? Um, so we actually have had, half, I don't know, let's pretend I don't know. Um, one customer who looked at those two things and went like, okay, I'm going to run with replica size two, but with local RAID underneath the OSD to protect against you know, the outage from a drive failing and keep all recovery of a single drive failure local to a node. I'm like, I was like, ah, but I could kind of see that point because that's what made that use case work, right? And that's an area where maybe we need to look at that in some more detail because with Ceph volume, we could just like make it all one big well. And if the OSD actually scaled well, we wouldn't actually need to have so many different threads. So we'll see. But you know, this is something that actually matters in practice, right? So take away recovery is slow because you have to go through that very slow path. If that's all behind an HBA with 12 gigabit, uh, gigabit networking on SAS dedicated to do those drives, it's actually quite fast. Ceph recovers slower by design because it's a recovering across nodes, right? Um, and a local, the, that node pair has the same problem. If the entire node goes down, then you have the familiar problem, right? Um, and then there's another design choice that sometimes come up when people compare us against other storage solutions out there. Ceph replicates and recovers on the back end, right? Especially the front end replication. So the client only ever talks to the primary OSD. Um, some other solutions do this in the front end. The client actually talks to multiple copies of the data. Um, it's very difficult to determine which one is the better solution because they have very different tr trade offs. Like in our case, it means we get to use different, we get to use a beefier back end network that's dedicated to all this. So it helps with throughput if you have proper sizing. Um, however, if you have a single threaded workload, um, the other work, with a single client, that client can load balance and get possibly better performance. Um, it all evens out when the network gets saturated because then you're, well, saturating your network and you know, all clients sort of get the same. But you know, again, different trade-offs, right? So if you're comparing against a solution like that, then keep in mind that this is why Ceph does it. This simplifies it because Ceph, the primary OSD, knows that it has a good copy of the data, right? So this is another side effect of the consistency models. Um, yeah, and then a lot of the algorithms in Ceph are based on the assumption that everything balances out at scale, right? Especially if you look at how Crush distributes data across the drives. Um, the data placement is pseudo-random, which is awesome because, you know, the client doesn't have to ask a server where the data is, can just run the same algorithm and be pointed as the right server. Um, but when you have few nodes, uh, yeah. Um, or a few drives, then pseudo-random isn't always perfectly balanced, especially when you then have large objects. Um, so at one point, this all relies on the idea that our higher level objects and workloads are actually striped at the RADOS level, right? At one point, we had a customer um, uploading a 100 gigabyte object with RADOS put, which, you know, works, but Crush does not does not agree, right? Crush does not like that, right? So you then have this very huge object sitting in this placement group. It takes forever to replicate. Your data distribution is all wrong, right? So that's, yeah, so we, that's quite easy to fix, but it's again, it's a different assumption. 
And not all data patterns like this, when you have very large low-level objects, they don't balance perfectly. And there's some use cases with Rados clones and snapshots that possibly also don't balance perfectly because they sort of go to the same placement group that we're currently investigating. And in general, with all of the issues about placement uh, groups, there, Josh talks this morning was actually pretty great. I'm not going to repeat everything here. Go listen to the recording if you haven't been in there. There's a lot of work happening here with, a, um, with both the PG auto scaling and the um, balancer that makes this better, but especially when you have small environments, it can still be a problem. Which brings us basically to, to how people start with trying Ceph, right? Well, I did a four node POC and Ceph underperformed. And, you know, because I, I just was trying it with my Windows clients and, uh, you know, and yeah, that's, that's not the best use case for Ceph, right? It works. All the functions are there, but you get basically none of the benefits, right? Um, you have, your workload will typically have low concurrency. You have few storage devices, especially if you have hard drives that you grab from somewhere because if it's a POC, a proof of concept implementation. Um, you have bad data balancing. You have an impact of co-locating all the services on those three, four, two nodes even. Um, you have the fairly thick layers of Ceph that eat into that and little of the gains. Um, so you see all the pain and little of the benefits, right? So basically what this means is economy of scale, you're not getting it, right? Um, so this is an oversimplification. It's not like we did a formal study. But you have a high entry fee when you want to deploy Ceph, right? So you, when your first Ceph class is like this. And then every other node is like tuk, 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 tuk. So it makes not a lot of difference whether you deploy 100 nodes or five, right? A little bit of an oversimplification. It obviously does make a difference. But it's not as huge as deploying the first five. Um, so once you have all the hardware in place, which is the hard part that other people do, I only do the software, um, th at that point in time, you run your automated installer. And whether you point that at 100 nodes or 5 nodes, it's really not it, the runtime changes, but the effect is the same, right? So Ceph is one of those cases that's inverse to selling razor blades, right? It's, you know, you buy a razor, and then the other blades are more expensive, right? The first shot is not free with Ceph, right? So that's, just something to keep in mind when you're managing expectations. Um, when you think that five node cluster will scale linearly to 100 nodes, right? You went through those, oh man, all that trouble with those five nodes. And I, I'm never going to do that 20 times as much. It's not true, right? It may be the same amount of work or twice as much. So I don't know. It's very hard to say exactly. But it's, you know, Ceph at scale is actually quite easy to operate. So. Bring me, let me bring out my next topic, right? Big data, right? Ceph is all about big data. Let me, let's be real. Your big data is not big, right? Um, so if you look at what kind of capacity you can hold on a single node with redundancy included these days, you're looking at something half a petabyte worth of data. That's something you can easily fit into a single chassis, right? It's no problem. Um, SSDs get similarly dense and cheap. Um, and of course, there are trade-offs about the network bandwidth you have and the scalability of it all. But um, big data, right? Um, occasionally, somebody comes up and says, well, I have big data because I have you know, this unnamed in-memory database, which is really a lot of data. And I go like, well, how much data do you have? And they go, 20 terabytes. And I go like, here's your hard drive. So it's not, that's not, it's not a good use case for Ceph, right? Nobody is well served by trying to build a Ceph cluster that serves all of 20 terabytes. It's, it's, there are different solutions out there that serve this better, right? Um, and maybe there's still a use case because you want all the scalability. This is just how you start. You have this growth trajectory. You have all the protocols you want, and your data is growing, right? And that's when you typically will see a slide like this, right? Mobile data, IoT, transactional data, medical, emails, videos, right? And then exponential growth, right? And that's true. Data is growing. Uh, my own data, I've noticed, is growing more like linearly and not exponentially, at least the data I have access to, not the one everybody keeps about me. So I don't know how that adds up. And if you're like, if you have a growing customer base that's growing linearly, and for each of them, their data is growing linearly, the compound effect may as well be exponential, right? That, that's probably true. Um, but I, I, I dug out some statistics. So these statistics actually go back to all of, since 1980, 
Um, and um, also the pricing statistics. Turns out that basically price per capacity has been dropping at steadily 28, 30 percentage since then. So it's a, almost like Moore's law. Capacity is getting cheaper. And at the same point in time, drives are getting about that much larger, right? Um, so unless your data is growing faster than 30 percent year over year, roughly, um, it will not outgrow that chassis you can currently fit it in, right? Um, it's just something to keep in mind. And maybe your data is growing faster. We've seen that. Many customers have that, especially when you're keeping medical data, life of patient plus 40 years, yes you need a scale-out solution, right? So, um, but then, OK, OK, your data is growing, all this. And then you want your workload to scale. Workload considerations. Does it, though? If you just take a traditional workload and throw it at Ceph, probably not going to perform very well. Single-threaded workloads are terrible. You know, millions of objects in a flat, indexable, listable data structure do not scale well. Sometimes they do if you avoid the operations that actually require the system to sequentially enumerate all of them consistently. Um, POSIX file system semantics don't scale. Legacy workloads struggle with the different guarantees of objects. So when you, have your e when you have a DR concept for your Ceph cluster first, shout out to you. You're awesome. Um, but RBD, CephFS, and Rados Gateway have different consistency guarantees when you replicate them, right? So you have to, your workload has to cope with the fact that the different data pools are probably not at the same same level of consistency. That's already a challenge. Um, so perhaps your workload fits on a single node. In that case, uh, maybe reconsider. You know, maybe a different solution is best. Um, and again, storage area networks or network attached storage can be great if you have, you know, single node can hold your data and you have different worker nodes. You can scale that out fairly well to say. 16 hundreds of, and maybe even 72 client nodes, if that server provides sufficient bandwidth. And make no mistake, a single chassis these days with a thin layer storage system, you can get 400 gigabit of bandwidth out of a single server. I mean, I've seen the benchmarks and I've seen that happen in practice. If, that's, if you have a low protocol overhead, that server can deliver like 40 gigabit, gigabyte per second, right? That's pretty amazing. Quadruple bonded 100 gigabit NICs pretty fast. Um, so, but yeah, you want to build that scalable network attached storage system with Ceph, because Ceph, iSCSI, NFS, SIFs, it's all there, right? And that's true, but gateways, right? So with these, these are not cluster-aware client protocols for the most part. Some of that is changing, parallel NFS, SIF scale-out, iSCSI multi-passing, but then, you know, it's all there. Um, but the least you get is an additional network hop which impacts your individual I.O. request latency. Throughput is fine. You know, throughput eventually will scale up, but you have that additional latency hop. And especially when that goes to the MDS for metadata operations, keep that in mind. And it negates quite a bit of Ceph smarts, right? So yes, we can do all that. And there are use cases where that makes sense because Ceph is cheap to scale. And it, you, know, you can build an iSCSI gateway that has hundreds of petabytes of storage behind it. You know, and maybe you have that separated, we are different clients, and then it works fine and scales, but you know, just keep that in mind. Hyperconverged infrastructure. Um, yeah, so Ceph does all the protocols. I'm not going to go into the security considerations too much because I don't want to annoy the <coughs> CPU vendors um, when you collocate multi tenancy on your environment. Um, but Ceph does not really do data locality, right? Ceph is, you know, the data is distributed pseudo randomly in your cluster. Um, Rados classes could be a way around it, but it's tricky. Um, so it basically you get, you know, the data is probably not on the node where you are, where your workload is running. So depending on what you want to do, that can be tricky. And you can overcome some of this with caching, right? So let's look at caching instead. Um, so first, there are several places where you could be caching, right? Local to the workload, like client side from our cl cluster perspective. There could be a cache tier words about cache tiering. Um, you could be caching at the OSD level. The OSD has an in-memory cache, right? Or even below the OSD level with you know, DM cache built into LVM, um, into LVM volume, uh, Ceph volume, sorry, B cache or the Intel iCache solution. And um, that's all fine. You know, that all helps. And let's first look at some of those questions, right? So people add caches because they want better performance. 
and you know they add a cache and then they run a random workload against it and it's not faster. Hmm. Well, yeah, because you're not actually accessing any data twice. You know, it. You know, you're not getting any read benefit from that, and you're not even overrides don't get combined because you're only hitting each block once. Um, also, inverse, I benchmarked everything. It was great, but my actual workload, eventually everything slowed down, and your caching is broken. And I'm like, no, you overflow, overflowed the cache. It's like, initially, everything was fine because you stayed within the working set, stayed in the cache, right? And then eventually, you regress to filling, you know, flushing the cache. Um, yeah. So those are all variations of basically benchmarking caches wrong. Because eventually, they will fill up an overflow. Um, and initially, they're empty. And then writes are fast if you have a write-back cache. And reads are just as fast as before. Um, and eventually, when you keep throwing random data at your cache, um, writing eventually will slow down because it has to flush. And at that point, you have both data coming in and data being pulled out. Cache eviction is one of the three hardware problems in computer science. So eventually, there's some overhead. So at best, at that point, it wouldn't slow you down, but in reality, it will a little. Um, and when you read only once, caching also doesn't provide a huge advantage on, on read patterns, unless your workload fits into the cache for which you have to appropriately size. And write caches provide a huge benefit for bursty workloads, but not so much for sustained you know, max throughput. Um, and let's, let's now get quickly off on the tangent on cache tiering. Um, because cache tiering is actually useful if that's what you need. Um, it does not magically make your cluster go faster. Um, because first, the objects are actually physically migrated from one tier to the other. right? Um, they are migrated over the network to the cache tier and eventually back. You know, may, may, at some point, they keep in both places when they are unmodified copies. But you know, that, that cache eviction is very tunable. So there is a huge amount of complexity. Um, and is it cost efficient still? Is it, maybe you get benefit from just making your backend layer faster. Um, because like, when you have like, three-way replication in the front versus 10 plus 4 in the back with either erasure coding, and you use a much more expensive um, front-end tier, you have to buy a lot more of that. So sometimes the price economy doesn't work out. And does it perform? Right? Your front-end tier has three-way three -way write amplification. And your backend does not. My, with 10 plus 4, you get 40% write overhead on the network and on the storage devices. So depending on the, your workload, maybe caching isn't actually the, providing the benefit you think it does. And about those write caches, what is a durability and availability model, right? Three-way replication is not as durable as 10 plus 4. You know? And when you do something like persistent client-side caching, which RBD can now do, uh, if that client node dies, you have lost everything that's still in cache, right? Your copy may still be consistent, but it's also not up to date. If your workload is fine with that, that's great. If it's not, you know, that's just something that you have to keep in mind, right? Everybody goes on about having ECC memory, and then they all write it to that disk where it passes through the buffer cache on the disk device, which is not protected at all, things like that, right? So your ability model and availability model of the cache are really important. Um, also, when you front end multiple hard drives with one NVMe, with, say, DMX cache, and that NVMe goes down, you have just lost all the OSDs which you need to consider and replicate. So, um, and just closing it out on benchmarks, um, when you go for maximum throughput benchmarking, you get terrible latency. And that's expected, right? So because you're trying to cram as much through as possible, you're piling on request on request. And that's just like that you're trying, you know going in that you will not be able to service all of those requests. So when you want to actually benchmark for, perform for latency, you would probably only benchmark at like 30 40% maximum throughput, right? And also, you have to account for that when you, that the last one should be a no-brainer. Um, you have to make sure that you can sustain your bandwidth while the node is down. Right? So that brings us to hardware, nodes being down. Right? Monocultures are cheap but terrible, right? or cheaper. Right? Um, it's easy. right? You buy that one SKU, the one piece of hardware, 20 times everywhere, and it's easy. Right? It's easy to order. It's easy to set up. All the systems have 100% equivalent. And on the especially terrifying, <laughs> 
line, I've highlighted all the incidents in, in bold where we have seen that go wrong, right? So especially network interfaces, we had one very, one incident where basically the network driver in combination with the firmware and the switches would panic the system anywhere between three to 60 seconds after boot. All the systems, because they were all the same NIC, all connected to the same switches. They had two of them, bless them, but they were all the same. And they were all oopsing and panicking every 30 seconds, every single node individually. And Ceph is pretty resilient, but not that resilient. And um, we ended up fixing it for the customer together with a, a vendor for the NIC firmware, but those were not pleasant weeks. Um, the customer was annoyed, we were annoyed, everyone was annoyed. Um, eventually, it was fixed, which it was a great experience, but you know, monocultures are not very resilient. And just hard drives, hard drive firmware is just the same. Um, we had a firmware incident where you would write data, and the drive would go, I wrote the data, fine. And then you would go read it, and it would go, Eno data, which is called a read write. You can, the drive notices when it tries to read that the data block was basically corrupted and refuses to give you bad data. Fair. Um, and there was a firmware bug. So it affected all the drives at that customer deployment. Mm, took a while to settle that with a um, drive vendor who shall remain unnamed. Um, and yeah, and the intermediate system integrator had only one SKU for the two terabyte drive. We were like, we want new two terabyte drives, but not that vendor. And they were like, well, we have qualified three vendors for that two terabyte drive model. This is our SKU for ordering a two terabyte drive. We cannot guarantee you are not getting that vendor again. We're like, you know, this is the kind of thing that you have to deal with because you're buying commodity off the shelf hardware. This is not set up for somebody going in and saying, I want this particular drive model with that firmware, right? So it's, and frankly, don't even bother because it's not sustainable. You know, when your Ceph cluster is hopefully in operation for like multiple years, right? Because of the data growth that we have established that your data has, right? Your big data is growing. Um, so you're not going to be buying the same hardware next year, right? You're just not. So just go in accepting that you're buying from multiple vendors, right? And save yourself that pain. Um, because buying cheap can also mean buying twice. Um, Software-defined storage uses commodity off-the-shelf hardware, and consumer hardware does lie, right? The, the most famous things is um, ha consumer hard drives lying about their write caches being disabled, and because then the bench, well, if they actually did that, the benchmarks would be bad, so they lie about it, right? So you want to do some minimal qualification of the hardware that you buy to make sure that this is actually not happening, and that actually happens with SSD drives. SSD drives sometimes have memory in front of them that can sustain the write for like 60 seconds before they fall back to flushing to the cheaper backend flash, right? Because flash has different quality levels and different speed levels, and it's much cheaper to only have so much of that, and you know, they, they're basically hybrid SSDs. And initially, we also had SSD drives that would be really fast for the first two weeks and then degrade as the wear level kicked in, right? So, so that all unfortunately happens, and so you don't want to actually buy the cheapest consumer-grade hardware. And again, that's not a problem when you buy for a production environment, but this is typically how people build their pilots and then run into all these things without knowing that they're going to run into all these things and then walk away unsa unsatisfied, right? So just something to be aware of. Um, and yeah, this is, this is a favorite of mine. Have you ever looked at some of those rec tables or rec diagrams that people draw? Like all the OSDs, right? You have a rack full of OSDs, and then you have the rack with all the metadata services, right? All the overheads that you don't scale so much because you know three months are probably going to sustain you, you know, through several racks of OSDs. And there's this one power supply going into that rack where all your mons are and all your MDS and all your radios gateways. Hmm. So, but otherwise the racks would be different. We like our racks to be the same, right? All the racks should be identical. Uh, no, they shouldn't. Um, you know, or maybe have have a, have a mon in one and a Rados gateway in the next, and alternate between that. You know, maybe you can do something like that. But if you have, yeah, let, I, I thought about actually drawing a picture here, but 
it's hopefully not necessary. It's a, just a bad idea if you correlate your failure domains like that. Um, in general, um, ignore the throughput you get from Ceph because throughput is easy to get or total IOPS. You can just buy more hardware. You can all just, just add more nodes, add more storage devices, right? Um, that's easy. That's easy to scale. We can scale that really well. What you will not easily be able to scale is latency unless we get crimson to you and latency goes down magically. Um, so people buy 40 gigabit because it's faster than 25. True, but you know, the latency, the signaling rate is lower on 40 gigabit than on 25 gigabit. Um, so I don't think anyone should be buying that anymore. Everybody should be buying 25 or 50 gigabits these days. Um, sometimes people disagree. Um, but it's just because the latency is the one thing that's really hard to fix because that's basically static. Um, and then people compare a local SSD performance to the one that they get out of the distributed system and notice that it's much slower. Yeah, because you have to go through the network multiple times. Right, again, so focus on the latency. That's really, that's the one thing that's really hard to fix. Um, and also per node pricing, right? Is it, uh, I'm going to get short. Um, so per node pricing is hard because it encourages the idea that you should have fewer, bigger nodes. You shouldn't, right? You, you should have you know, reasonable nodes, but you should not make them, you, know, you should not have like a petabyte of capacity on one node, just split it, right? Talk to your vendor about discounts um, because that also means so you have more bandwidth per storage device, you have less impact on outages, you're losing less of your capacity. And remember, every spindle you lose is part of the bandwidth that you're losing. And it's also less bandwidth you have to, rec or less capacity you have to recover if that node really does not come back. Right? If a one petabyte node goes down, you have to recover that, right? So make sure that not a single failure is a significant part of your availability. Um, and it's also cheaper to scale. You can scale, scale in smaller increments, right? That's also quite useful. Buying another of those petabyte nodes is probably quite expensive. Buying a 200 terabyte node is much less so, right? Um, and at the other end of the scale, when I say light white nodes, I don't mean flimsy, okay? So sometimes people want to absolutely use Ceph and they have big data. So, and they go, this, this happened, right? Um, well, we are now using one terabyte hard drives and two of them, one or two of them per node, um, so we can meet the minimum requirement for failure domains. And like, here's a bigger hard drive. Um, so, because that, that does not give you economy of scale. This is not cost efficient. Unless you do this because you have this hyperconverged environment where you just put that into the slot where it makes sense, that's fine. Um, and you have that drive bay anyway, so use it. Um, that's fine, but don't do this if you're explicitly building a Ceph cluster, right? Um, unless you, your demo, that's what we do with our Raspberry Pi at the booth, and that's fine, it's great for demo, right? And um, here, my Joao quote, um, sometimes people run Ceph on public cloud um, because sometimes the pricing model from the public cloud vendors for long-term storage or persistent cluster-wide storage is strange and it's actually cheaper to buy three times as much ephemeral storage attached to your instance than it is to buy their distributed storage service which is basically performing arbitrage on their pricing model um, and this works it can be great it's all what we all do for testing and after all but from a performance point of view that's pretty terrible because you don't have the transparency into what's actually going on right you don't know what the hypervisors are doing where your network traffic is going I it's it's just I've had to support this. We made it work. It was a fun experience. I learned a lot. Um, just think about whether it's really what you want to do. Um, so almost on time, closing out. Um, again, going back to this, right? So when you have that workload that you need, Ceph is the one thing that can do that, right? There's nothing else that can. Um, but there are other solutions out there that can do other things well. Right? And we are taking Ceph to close that gap, but depending on the time of day and which year it is, you know, the trade-offs may not swing always towards Ceph. Um, we hope that you have that hyperscale use case with you know, that exponential data growth, because that is lovely. Like I said, I like bread, um, even if I bake it myself. Um, so, and 
this is probably what I would like to leave you with. So open source Ceph is infinitely flexible, right? You can do many, many things with it. It has all the knobs. Um, you can make all the choices. You can adapt it to your environment. The downside is you have to make all the choices. Somebody has to make all those choices for you, right? So plan for learning when you deploy a system. Plan to adjust what you're doing. And remember that there is no such thing as a free lunch, or in this case, a free dinner, right? So nothing is free, and that's it. So if you want to know more, come talk to us. Come reach to us. This is me. Thank you for your time, and have a lovely evening. And if there are any questions, please feel free to come and talk. Oh. Why did you spell my name wrong? <laughs> I, I showed it to you. No, no, no. no, you actually just asked me where, about the, the tilde. Yeah. <laughs> you okay. Put it on yeah, top we'll of the wrong letter. talk about that over dinner. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Anything else? If not, then enjoy the Birds of a Feather sessions, which are also happening. And enjoy dinner and see you tomorrow morning at 9.